The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. I think there's a tendency for the young generation to dismiss the older generation as irrelevant. Sometimes they might be right, but not always. And I think that perspective taking is best when it goes both ways. Then, later tonight. People in my generation watching TV and reading the printed news of their choice can go just as wrong on total misinformation as any gen generation Z person. Whether you care or not, the fact of your birth assigns you to a generation. And according to psychologist and author Gene Twenge's latest and most comprehensive book, whichever one it is, it's foundational to understanding how major shifts in our world shape us in the broadest terms. The book is called Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for America's Future. And it brings Gene Twenge back to our airwaves from San Diego, California. And I can already imagine, Professor Twenge, you're thinking to yourself, did he say Gen Z? Yes, I'm sorry. This is a Canadian show. We don't say Gen Z. But with all of that, let me welcome you back to our airwaves. It's great to see you again. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. You write that when you were born has a larger effect on your personality and attitudes than the family who raised you does. Okay, let's dive in there. Why would that be the case? Well, some of it is that family environment has a surprisingly small effect on, on personality, but a lot of it is just the enormous impact of growing up at a different time. I mean, when you think about what it was like to live 200 years ago or 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, how you lived your life day to day – your life course in terms of when you, say, finished your education or when you got married or started your career was completely different. The technology that you used was completely different. The values and attitudes that most people hold have also changed. It's just fundamentally different. I can remember a time, though, when we used to categorize ourselves by whether we were kids of the Depression or whether we grew up during the war or post-war babies or Vietnam babies, that kind of thing. Is that, in your judgment, no longer the way we ought to be thinking of these things? Yeah, that's the traditional theory of generational differences, is that generations are shaped by the age they are when they experience certain major events, like wars or economic depressions or pandemics. However, those major events don't have that big of an impact on day-to-day -day life in the long term. And what does is technology. That is what makes living now different from living in the past. So not just smartphones and computers, but also things like washing machines and air conditioning and trains and airplanes. All of these make living now very different from previous decades. Let's do an excerpt from the book that focuses on that very issue. Sheldon, if you would, bottom of page one. Let's bring that graphic up and I'll read along. Technology makes individualism possible. Until well into the 20th century, it was difficult to live alone or to find the time to contemplate being special, given the time and effort involved in simply existing. Does the same technology have a similar cultural impact in individualist America as it does say in more collectivist Japan, for example. Yeah, so that whole idea of individualism and collectivism began with the research on cross-cultural differences. So for example, the US, Canada, the UK are more individualistic than a society like India or Japan. But all of these societies have increased in individualism over time. It's just how much they've increased and the ways that they've increased can vary based on specific culture or country. Let's go through it then, because there are, there are five basic, I know you added a sixth at the end, but basically there are five basic generations, and we're going to go through them now. And if you would, just give me like a, a brief blast on each one as we go through and give us how their cultures sort of are and or were. 
And you start with the silence, the silent generation, 1925 to the end of World War II, 1945. Tell us about them. Yeah, so many people haven't even heard of the silent generation. Mm -hmm. So they are in between the greatest generation who fought World War II and the boomers. However, you really have heard of them. So the silent generation, they were the leaders of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement. So two of its most famous members, Martin Luther King Jr. and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Why do you call them the silence? Well, I don't. Um, someone started calling them that in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. And I think they got that reputation for in just being a post-war generation. They married young. They had their kids young. So the idea was that they weren't really saying much in the 50s, but they had a lot to say later on. Gotcha. All right, let's talk about the generation that tends to grab a disproportionate amount of attention, mostly because they insist on it. The boomers, 1946 to 64. Give us a blast on them. Well, so the boomers are named after the huge rise in the birth rate during those years. So they are a very large generation, and that's why they've had such a big impact is because of their sheer size. The culture has been focused on their life stage at pretty much every stage of, of their lives. So boomers took those changes to the laws that the silent generation got going and really lived them. You know, they were the ones who ended up changing hearts and minds just through the way that they ended up living in terms of more quality based on race and gender and sexual orientation. So, and they also took individualism and started to explore it much more than the silence ever did. And I learned in your book, three American presidents, all boomers, all born in the same year, all born in the same summer. Go ahead. You want to name them? Yeah, of 1946. So that's uh, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump, all born in the summer of 1946. There we right go. Right at the beginning of the baby boom. Right. All right, next one, Generation X, Gen X, 1965 to 1979. A word on them. So I'm a Gen Xer myself, and we are such an undefined generation. That's how we got our name. X is the letter for an unknown quantity. And I think that's still somewhat appropriate. Uh, a lot of people kind of forget that Gen X exists between boomers and millennials fighting it out. Um, a lot of Gen Xers like that. They like flying under the radar, just doing their work, having their families. One thing I really uh, ended up figuring out about Gen X in the course of writing the book is how much Gen X values resilience and being tough in a way that started to fade with millennials and later. So a lot of the cultural and political discussions around free speech and cancel culture, the generational break is between Gen X and millennials. And I guess we should always apply the 3M adjective to millennials, the much maligned millennials, because they are the next group we have to talk about. 1980 to 1994, why so much maligned? Well, you know, I, it, it might be true that millennials have gotten even more criticism, but Gen X got criticized, boomers certainly got criticized, uh, and they still are criticized. I mean, I think that just happens. I think it's really unfortunate. I mean, when you look at these things, these are big cultural changes that have affected all generations in one way or another. We're really in this together. And the idea of whose fault it is or who should we blame, I think is really counterproductive. So millennials um, are defined by taking that individualism to the next level. So it's not just equality, although that's central to them. It's also about just to be yourself and you can be anything you want to be and very high expectations and a lot of optimism. And then that ran into the Great Recession so started to have some qualifications there. So there's a lot of underlying anger of nobody told us it was going to be this hard. The good news is that contrary to popular belief, millennials are actually doing really well economically. The line for a long time is that millennials are all broke. They're not going to do as well as their parents. Well, at least in the U.S. data, median incomes among 25 to 44-year-olds are at all-time highs, and that is corrected for inflation, including, including housing costs and, and other costs of living. We will dive into that more later because people listening or watching this right now are going to say, there's no way that's true, but we're <laughs> going to come back to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Finally, Gen Z, or Gen Z, as you call it in the States, mm -hmm. 1995 to 2012, and they are well-known because why? 
Well, they were the first generation to spend their entire adolescence in the age of the smartphone and ubiquitous social media. And that's had ripple effects across many areas of their lives. So for one thing, they have communicated with their friends online so much that they spend less time with their friends face to face. So that's true for teenagers. It's also now true for young adults that digital communication has replaced the in-person communication. And that would that that trend started around the early 2010s. It wasn't just due to the pandemic. The other thing that Gen Z or Gen Z is really known for is the enormous increase in mental health issues that again started around 2012. That, for example, teen depression doubled between 2011 and 2019 in the US, so even before the pandemic. And we have some good data from Canada, specifically from Ontario, showing the exact same thing in grade seven to grade 12 students in Ontario with big increases in mental health issues beginning in the early 2010s. And is it undeniable in your view that that is the case because they are digital natives as opposed to being digital immigrants? So we have to consider all possibilities here for why this increase occurred and why it occurred beginning in 2012. So I first presented this theory about six years ago in my book called iGen about this generation. And since then, no other plausible explanation has really come to the fore. Nothing else fits the data as well, partially because of the timing. So smartphones, uh, were used by the majority of North Americans around the end of 2012. That's also when social media use started to move from optional to virtually mandatory among teens. But it's not just a time sequence. It's what else had such an enormous impact on the day-to-day -day lives of teens? And the answer is nothing. Hmm. All right, let us, now that we've gone through all those five different generations, I do want to circle back to millennials because you did say something that I know is going to surprise a lot of people, the notion that they're not as economically badly off as they purport to be. In fact, they're doing better off than everybody expects. The word is we can't get the best jobs because you boomers won't retire. We can't get the best houses or any houses because prices have skyrocketed thanks to you boomers. And you have said the millennials either now or eventually are going to do even better than the boomers. What are you seeing that clearly so many others are not? Yeah, you know, the thing is, this is publicly available data from the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's not difficult to find. I didn't even have to do any stats analyses. They publish these tables. Median incomes are very high. Um, and the St. Louis Fed took a look at wealth building, which is important because it's not just about income, it's also about wealth. And that, that also takes into account things like student loans, which are you know, a big deal. And millennials are neck and neck in wealth building with Gen X, and they are on track to catch up to boomers as they get older. Uh, the housing market is an interesting example. So here there's some variation within the generation. Early millennials, if they bought, say before about 2020, have seen their house values skyrocket. But younger millennials who maybe have not yet bought, they're in a tough situation because prices are high and so are interest rates. So the counter I hear to these, these observations a lot as well, but housing prices have far outpaced inflation. Well, two things on that. Housing costs are a huge amount of the calculation that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses to correct for inflation. And second, what people forget is that in that huge rise in housing costs, in housing, sorry, in housing prices, is that housing costs have actually stayed relatively similar until about a year and a half ago because interest rates were so low. In the 1980s, interest rates for mortgages were 13%. And in 2020, they were about three. So that's a huge difference. And so the cost was actually similar. Millennials would suggest, though, that whereas we boomers needed to save on an average five years in order to be able to purchase a home or have the down payment to purchase a home, they have to save something in the area of 18 to 20 years in order to be able to do the same kind of thing. Now, the facts show that. They're not wrong about that, right? Well, it depends. It depends on when we're talking about. So if we're talking about people buying a house in 2010 when prices were a lot lower, older millennials were often buying houses at the time. They got the deal of a lifetime. So in that 
part, it wasn't true. Then after prices started to go up again, it is true that even with low interest rates, you still have to come up with a down payment for that housing cost. So in that place, saving for the down payment that's true. That that has become harder. Ironically, though, what has often happened with millennials is their boomer parents who have a lot of home equity will give or loan them the money. Or or when they die, these millennials are going to be very well off. That's what many people are expecting. Yes. Yeah. OK. There's another group here and I got to confess, I'd never heard of them. A sixth group that you have put together and um, well, I guess in part because they're new on the scene and their generation is expected to last starting in 2013, but lasting until 2029, the polars, polars, like polar bears. Uh, how did they get their name? What will define their culture? Yeah, so this is the post-Gen Z generation, born 2013 and later. So these were the young kids during the pandemic who, the, you know, the, the, the poor kindergartners who had to do their kindergarten and first grade online. Um, and I think that dividing line of 2013 is a good one because Gen Z, Gen Z, they all remember a time before the pandemic and pollers were not. So we don't have an agreed upon name for this group yet. Some people call them alphas, thinking, okay, we've run out of letters, and then we got to go back to the beginning and use the Greek letters. I'm not a big fan of the letters. Uh, they're kind of repetitive and not very descriptive. So I call this generation polars, after melting polar ice caps and political polarization, two things that are shaping their world right now and likely will in the decades to come. Now, we are, we have been taught, Gene, since we were kids, don't stereotype people. You can't put all, all people in one basket. So with that in mind, and having said all that, I mean, let's face it, there are stereotypes for each generation, and I'm hoping right now you will tell us what you believe to be the most true-to-life stereotype of one of these generations. Which is it? Mm. Well, you know, first I have to, I, we have to acknowledge the difference between stereotypes and data. So stereotypes are when you guess. Um, data is when you have actual data knowing what the average differences are. Even with that data, though, of course, not everyone is going to be at the average. So there's a lot of variation within each generation. Just like when you have differences, say, based on gender, there's plenty of variation among men and among women, even if you have an average difference. So I always have to acknowledge that. Uh, so there are some stereotypes that have some truth behind them, and then there are those that don't. Um, in the book, I debunk a lot of the stereotypes that are out there, like millennials are poor and all, all boomers are, are rich. Um, it's hard to pick one that is pervasive, that has some truth to it. If I had to, I would probably pick the one about millennials being overconfident. There's some good data to support that one. There we go, the much maligned millennials again. But let's figure out how much, how much has to happen to a particular generation for them to get this you know, overarching theme attached to them. But by that I mean, you know, we know that not all baby boomers were out there growing beards and long, hairs and, uh, long hair and becoming hippies and marching against Vietnam. And you know, not all Gen Xers are unambitious slackers and that type of thing. But, but what percentage of that group would have to have those characteristics for them to be defined, for a whole generation to be defined that way? Yeah, I think those types of perceptions are more anecdotal. And they are certain types and certain subsets of the generations. Because boomers are a great example. Sure, they were the hippies of the 60s, but then they became the yuppies of the 80s. And were those always the same people? Maybe, but a lot of times that was two subgroups. So that particularly happened with boomers because they're such a large generation. Um, but, you know, I think those things can only go so far, those perceptions, those ideas around subgroups. It's one reason why I'm much more happy to rely on these surveys of millions and millions of people to see, well, overall, how does this generation look on average? I'm really trying to get a number out of you, though. Is it is it fair to say if, I don't know, 25 percent, 50 percent of the people of a certain generation reflect a particular set of qualities, that's enough for us to categorize the entire generation in such a way? Do you have a number in mind? 
I, I don't for kind of a statistical reason. Um, most, of these, most of the time we measure these things in these in surveys or sometimes these are yes or no questions and we can say, you know, X percentage identify this way versus that way. But it's hard to come to that conclusion and put one number because there's just there's so much variation across the generation and it also depends on what trait you're talking about. Hmm. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to go at this one more time in as much as, and you've had this criticism before, so you've, you've heard it, that if you're born in the same year and one of you is a black man growing up in Mississippi and one of you is a white woman growing up in New England, you're the same generation, but your realities are really pretty different. So how do right, you actually because, categorize yeah. people that way? Well, I mean, of course, people differ in many, many ways other than just generation. But that they those those two still have their have their birth year in common. They still had certain experiences with technology, certain experiences with individualism, with uh, the pace of their life that they would have in common, even if these other demographic characteristics had some influences. I mean, you know, saying okay, they're 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 completely different. And generation doesn't have any impact because you have these other academic other demographic. Differences is like saying, oh, you know, women of different races don't have anything in common. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, here's how you summarize the current relationship among the different generations. You say silence and boomers are the powerful older siblings. Millennials and Gen Z are the energetic but misunderstood younger siblings. And Gen X, the middle child, is often forgotten. Okay, let's pick that apart. Why do millennials and Gen Z feel so misunderstood? Well, I think all generations feel mis misunderstood by the others in one way or another. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of it's sometimes very hard to take the perspective of someone who is 20 years older or 20 years younger than you. Uh, and there's certainly a tradition of older generations trying to understand younger ones, and sometimes they fail and sometimes they succeed. I also think it needs to go both ways. I think there's a tendency for the young generation to dismiss the older generation as irrelevant. Sometimes they might be right, but not always. And I think that perspective taking is best when it goes both ways. That means the older generation has to hold back on criticizing sometimes. It means the younger generation also has to try to take the perspective of the older occasionally. Hmm. Given the divide between the older and the younger siblings, which generational values are shaping the future of one of the fundamentals of all of our lives, namely work? Yeah, so there's some really interesting trends in terms of work attitudes. So I'll focus on Gen Z. So one thing that we see with Gen Z, and it's true of millennials as well, a lot of emphasis on work-life balance. So I don't want to work so much that I don't have things outside of work. Now, some older people see that as low work ethic. It's all a matter of perspective. The other piece is Gen Z is more likely to say that they want a job in which they can be directly helpful to other people. That's gone up in the big survey, say, of 18-year-olds in, in grade 12. So I think there's some opportunity here with the young adult generation now uh, with them really wanting to help. Hmm. Okay, Gene, let's talk some politics here, because you have suggested that a generation's political profile depends on, for example, how popular the president was during their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So let's go back. We can go back to the silence where Franklin Roosevelt was the president, and we can come all the way to present day where Gen Z had Donald Trump as the president, and of course, lots of presidents in between. Which generation mm -hmm. did best on that front? Well, I'm not sure it exactly works that way. I mean, what the, what the research suggests is the party and popularity of the president when you're young tends to tilt you either right or left, Democrat or Republican in the US. So millennials, for example, tilt Democrat because Obama was relatively popular, um, especially say compared to Trump or Biden. So with Gen Z, it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens because yep, Trump wasn't popular, 
Biden isn't particularly popular either. So they've experienced both a Republican and a Democrat president who weren't particularly popular. So where their leanings will go in the long run is a little harder to say. I, you know, I'm curious about this because, uh, again, I'm a, a part of the boomer generation. And in that generation, you've got John F. Kennedy assassinated, Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. hounded from office that he didn't run again, Richard Nixon uh, mm -hmm. impeached and then resigned. He writes, the boomer generation really should be very sour on politics given the three experiences of those three presidents. I'm not sure that's the case, though. I don't know. How do you see it? Yeah, that's true. I think there's there's a lot of different influences going on. And, you know, if you look at the survey data, yeah, boomers, especially as young people, were very politically involved. They they they, they still are. And Gen X less interested in politics. Millennials brought that back to an extent. And then Gen Z is voting at higher rates than millennials and Gen Xers did when they were young adults. So it'll be very interesting to watch that young generation and look at their political involvement because it's encouraging that more of them are voting. It's discouraging though that there's a very strong sense of pessimism, even nihilism in this group of the idea of things are terrible, they're gonna continue getting worse and there's nothing we could do about that. And I think so. There's these two roads forward. Maybe activism, maybe not so much. We got to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. In which case, uh, let's finish up on this. Which of the generations, in your view, had the greatest impact on how the future will unfold? Mm. That's a tough one. Um, it would probably be the boomers due to their sheer size and the amount of political power that they have had. I, I think it is a misperception to say that um, you know all boomers are, are rich and powerful. There's a large segment who are definitely not and are economically struggling and struggling with mental health, and that has to be acknowledged. But when you look at political dominance, it is hard to top the boomers. Hmm. Gene, I uh, tell you, there's so much to think about in this book. It's absolutely fascinating, and we're delighted you spend some time with us on TVO tonight. It's called Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for America's Future, and Canada's too, we can say. The professor absolutely. of psychology at San Diego State University, Gene Twenge. Thanks so much, Gene. Thank you. When Canadian media theorist and futurist Marshall McLuhan wrote his most influential works in the 1960s, it's hard to imagine he really envisioned our world as it is in all its technological and social media complexity. Still, his notion that the medium is the message endures, and even invites us to consider how the evolution of the media ecosystem has rippled across and perhaps even shaped subsequent generations. With us now on whether the avalanche of media makes us better informed than we were in the past, let's welcome, in order of generational seniority, from the baby boomers, Sue Ann Kelman, career journalist and professor of journalism now retired. From Generation X, Paolo Granata, associate professor of book and media studies at the University of St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto. From the millennial generation, Noor Malik, a marketing professional. And from Gen Z, TikTok content creator Hazel Thayer, who joins us from the left coast in Victoria, British Columbia. And it is wonderful to have you three here in our studio. Hazel, thanks for joining us out in BC. I want to start by taking a look. We're going to go through four different generations here and take a look at how these different generations consume media today. I'm going to take you through a bunch of numbers here, so hang in there. We're going to look at generations from 18 to 29, 30 to 49, 50 to 64, and then age 65 plus. Here's how they consume television. 18 to 29 year olds, not so much, right? Only 44%. But as we go down, increasing in the ages, 55% for the next generation, 74% for the next. And if you're 65 plus, 85% of you still watch television as a part of your media diet. How about radio? Again, the youngest generation, only 35%. Next down, 48%. Next, age 50 to 64, 55%. Age 65 plus, 46%. Print, if you're young, print is really not much of a feature of your life anymore, or if it ever was. 21% consume it. Age 30 to 49, 27%. 50 to 
50 to 64, 35%. This is newspapers, magazines, actually holding them in your hands. 65 plus, still half the people at 65 plus have print as an aspect of their lives. And how about the internet? Well, here we go, the digital natives. 18 to 29, 91% consume news on the internet. 30 to 49 year olds, 88%. 50 to 64 year olds, a little less, 78%. And for 65 plus, the seniors, only two thirds. Let's figure out at this table, virtual and actual, how you got into following the news in the first place. Sue Ann, take us back. How did it start? Well, we got the Telegram and the Star at home. Not the, the Telegram Globe. is a Toronto newspaper. Mm, yes, that yes. It has not existed for 50 years. <laughs> yes, exactly. Should, yeah. I, well, I thought you'd get the reference. <laughs> um, I don't think that I really paid much attention to anything except the cartoons until JFK was assassinated. Mm. And then suddenly everyone I was in junior high school with started following the news. How did you get into following the news? Well, it's a core memory for me, actually. My dad returning home from work at the hospital, and we would all gather together as a family and eat dinner and watch the evening news on television. Hmm. Paolo, how about you? Well, I got the news along with meals. So literally, our media diet was uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So following the news uh, during the meals. Media was part of the diet. Absolutely. I get you. Hazel, how about you? Uh, I think far before I sought out news, I would just see it on social media, see it being shared. Uh, and I don't believe I started seeking out news until around 2016. And how old were you at that time? Hmm, about 19, I think. 19 years old. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Let's do the follow-up question. Sue Ann, how have your media habits changed since it started? Well, we still get one newspaper. I won't say which one. I get two, uh, two others, two Americans, plus The Guardian online. I read way more online than I used to. And also, I find that TV news is a bit slow for me um, with the set format. So more and more, I'm getting that online, too, so that I can skip some stories. Huh. So you don't actually watch very much news on television anymore. It's on all the time. My husband is addicted. Yeah. But I'm finding it a slow and inefficient way of getting news. Current affairs is different, but not news. Interesting. <laughs> OK. How have your media habits changed with time? Yeah, I think starting off more with reading the newspaper and then gradually moving into the internet. So even with the internet, it's using more so news websites and then a combination of various social media to get my information. Do you get a newspaper delivered to your home? No, I don't. No kidding. No. I was kind of, it was a facetious <laughs> question in a way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Paolo, how about you? Well, I completed that transition of my generation from legacy media to digital media. So nowadays I do rely on social media and uh, I do look at the news uh, and on TV with the, let's say, the professor perspective. So to really look at uh, what's going on in the legacy media. But my media diet is more uh, closer now to the generation of my students. Do you get a newspaper delivered to your home? I used to when I was a child. <laughs> I used to when I was a child. <laughs> with okay. my family. Fabulous. OK. Hazel, how about you? Um, I have tried to avoid getting most of my news from social media, even though it is so easy. Uh, I would say that lately my habit has changed uh, to getting news from news websites directly and from newsletters direct from journalists, which is a fun, uh, a fun feature of the internet nowadays. Hazel, I'm not even going to ask you if you get a newspaper delivered to your home, because I know what the answer is. I know, she's shaking her head. <laughs> Here's how, uh, I want to show folks how Hazel does her thing. Um, okay, what are we going to do here? This is TikTok. Here's what a TikTok creator does. It's a clip of Hazel explaining the individual economics of carbon taxes while playing her favorite game. Okay? Are we with me here? Sheldon, roll it if you would. We have a carbon tax, right? And the point of the carbon tax is not for the government to make money. The point of the carbon tax, thank you, is to, um, you know, prevent people from polluting, of, of course. And so to avoid this having any unnecessary financial burden on just regular people, instead of keeping the money, it's revenue neutral, which just means, whoa, that they split it up evenly and send it back to people's bank accounts. So most people will make money off of Canada's carbon tax. It should be called a dividend. Um, and, you know, only the biggest polluters will actually lose out on the money. Um, I think that rather than being directly sent to our bank accounts, it should be handed out via money gun so everybody knows what it's for and can't get mad about the carbon tax. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, back to Zelda. <laughs> I got to tell you, you are fantastic. That is a that is a tremendous talent you just demonstrated there. <laughs> Never mind 
conveying all that information about the carbon tax, but while playing a video game, you were doing it. That's uh, astonishing. You have 120,000 followers and 3.5 million likes on your TikTok account. So let's figure that out. Who are your followers? Um, I, I did check it out, and um, my followers seem to be generally in the 25 to 32 range. Actually, of course, I get um, plenty of Gen Zs as well. Um, but for TikTok, anyway, my audience skews a little bit older, which I guess means that um, more than just Gen Z are on TikTok. And why do you think they follow you? Um, I think, ooh, I think that I try to combine, um, well, I guess you just saw, I think I try to combine um, facts about economics and climate with humor as much as possible uh, because it can be a very dry topic. And to confirm, you were not reading that stuff that you were saying to camera, correct? It took quite a few takes. Yeah, but still, that's a heck of an achievement. Well done. I was deeply impressed when I saw that. Thank you. Now, you and your fellow millennials, I know, like to think of yourselves as up-to-date people, au courant as it comes to the news. How important is that aspect of your generation's uh, view of itself? Yeah, I think it's fairly important. I think we've all grown up in a time where we've lived through some major events, both in the United States and Canada, as well as the COVID um, pandemic, which we've all kind of survived through for the last few years. So I think our absorption of news has become almost heightened to a perspective. So yeah, it's very important. What's the major international event of your life? Made, I, I would say it would be COVID-19. I think that's really? the major the major thing because it had so many impacts to the way that we live and how much our work transformed. Like, for example, I used to be working in person five days a week, commuting downtown Toronto, and now I've been rem working remotely for the last three years. So that's a pretty major impact mm. on my life personally. What year were you born? 1990. So you were 11 for 9-11. Yes, I was. Which is a fairly impressionable age. And it, I, it is. So not 9-11, though. Not 9-11, just because I was younger when that happened. So the direct impacts to me were less, whereas now in my life, the impact that COVID-19 has had, I think, is more palpable on a daily basis for me. Okay. Paolo, among many things, you are a Marshall McLuhan scholar. And McLuhan, as we said in the intro, coined that famous phrase, the medium is the message. How do you think that expression applies to what we're talking about here? Well, to put it simple, the medium is a message means that uh, content is important, but the context makes a difference. And now uh, uh, we live in a different context, and the context uh, uh, shapes uh, the way we perceive reality, the way we perceive the world around us, the way we undertake our current affairs. Uh, and so looking through different generations, uh, media played a different role. And I see this difference. Uh, I see myself as... Uh, raised with the TV, like a babysitter, right? Mm -hmm. and, and TV was a kind of uh, detaching medium because I was in front of the TV, right? My, my parents were yelling, oh, you're in front of the TV all the time. Now, well, my students, uh, younger generation said, I'm not in front of social media, I'm on social media. Hmm. I'm on Facebook, or on Instagram. That's a huge of a difference. What, being does that, in front. what does that convey, the difference in that preposition? Convey that uh, for my generation, uh, media were tools, uh, services, channels uh, to get informed, uh, to get engaged. For this generation, for the younger generation, it's a world they live in, within which they live. So the media are the environments within which they live. It's a fundamental uh, distinction. So that's why in front or on. Well, I won't say I'm on TV, right? Except, my, well, maybe they you are. can say that <laughs> you are on TV all the time, mm. but we don't say so, right? Mm. They are in on the media. Gotcha. Well, we, we showed the comparison, Suan, earlier between those who consume television, radio, print, and internet, and the differences among the generation. Does the knowledge of what's happening in our world depend on which of those four platforms you're in, on, or in front of? Absolutely not. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. I lectured, uh, after I retired, I lectured on fake news several times until it became too depressing. And what I have to acknowledge is people in my generation watching TV and reading the printed news of their choice can go just as wrong on total misinformation as any gen generation Z person. Hmm. Uh, it is your ability to 
evaluate information, your willingness to look at a wide variety of information instead of tailoring it to your own prejudices. I know that there's a lot of concern, which I share, that the attention span goes down when when people are on social media all mm -hmm. the time. And I did see that when I was teaching. But what I see in my generation are an awful lot of anger addicts watching the TV and yelling at it all day <laughs> long. And they are no more informed than someone who is only looking at Facebook. The difference it, is when they're yelling at the TV, only they are hearing it. When they're yelling it on Twitter, thousands of other people are hearing it. That is absolutely it. true. But mm -hmm. you can have, look, the mainstream media, say, 100 years ago, was every bit as biased as Fox News. What I ask people to look for is, is there any accountability? If this is completely false, is someone going to have to pay for it? But of course, most people don't want to listen even to that. I guess what I would like to say is misinformation is available across all platforms. <laughs> mm. Hazel, let me get you on that. Do you think your generation, uh, let me put it this way. We baby boomers, I think, because we grew up with television news, tend to prize it as a more reputable source of information than, say, most of what you might find on the Internet. Now, of course, you know, brands are brands at the end of the day. But d does your generation have that same, does it have differing views of the reliability of the different media platforms? I, I will say that I personally am held accountable by the people who follow me. Like I am expected to report my sources, uh, check, uh, check my facts, and when I'm incorrect, people will tell me. And so I think I think that at least among the Gen Z, Gen Z audience that I have, um, there's a lot more. They're a lot more credulous of the news that they consume. Hmm. Uh, I think it's because we all grew up watching MythBusters. <laughs> okay. Noor, how about for you? Does something that you see on the television news delivered by a stentoriously voiced anchor behind a desk have more credibility for you than something you might read on the internet? You know, not necessarily. I think a big part of the distinction is really the sources that you are getting it from. Because even within social media, we have to remember that so many brands and organizations have presence there. So mm -hmm. you'll be able to find CBC, CTV, um, NPR, for example. So there are credible news sources that you'll see on social media. The other thing we have to be aware of with social media is also that there are algorithms that are designed to show you more of what you're responding to. So if you're going down a rabbit hole, you will go further down that rabbit hole because it's been designed to keep your attention focused on that for that long. Okay. I don't think we're going down a rabbit hole here, but I want to see more of Hazel. Uh, shall we took a, take a look at another clip? Sheldon, if you would, let's roll this next one. You know what simply boggles my brain about the youths these days? Like you, we, we, I'm technically Gen Z. We grew up on the internet, right? On the World Wide Web. Can't do a Google search. What? You don't know how to Google. Like, I can't believe it. I'll be, I'll be posting things on, or I'll be referencing things in a video of mine, and there'll be all these comments being like, how can I find that? I don't know. Maybe on the magical machine on every device that has like a compendium of all human knowledge. Maybe if you type it in there, it might come up. Okay, is there a sense, Hazel, that your generation, because it's mistrustful of authority and it doesn't believe in objectivity as much as, say, my generation does, uh, d does and did, uh, you're engaged in very much fact-checking to make sure you don't fall into disinformation. That's the gist of the argument. Is it true? Um, I, I think at least from the corner of the internet that I am on, there is a lot of fact-checking and a lot of debunking. For example, on like major news media, you don't see a lot of videos or um, news articles about debunking other news articles, whereas you see that all the time online. Um, so, but yeah, we, we, we do love to fact check. Um, and as for that video, yes, I think more people need to learn to Google. <laughs> <laughs> right. Paolo, we are going to Ottawa to interview Samantha B, who has made a fantastic, she's originally from Toronto and she's made a fantastic career for herself, um, with comedy. Not so much making fun of the news, but using comedy in some respects to deliver an important news message. What do you make of this phenomenon? And of course, she's one of many people who are doing this. What do you make of this phenomenon of turning the news into comedy as a way of making a different point? Yeah, it turns into the idea that news is entertainment. And among many other platforms, so particularly the new generations are accustomed to 
pay for high quality contents in the streaming platforms. And so news become part of this uh, spectacle, so the society of the spectacle, where even news again become, uh, becomes entertainment. And so they are even uh, willing to pay for this kind of entertainment if there is a high quality, well engaged uh, and uh, well, uh, well received uh, content in this kind. Hey, so you do that, right? I mean, comedy is all part of your shtick, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think a lot of what I talk about would would not be very well received or you know listened to if I didn't add a little bit of comedy to it. Is the Daily Show nor part of your daily content? It used to be for quite some time actually, but I think the host changes shifted it up for me a little bit. So without John Stewart, it's not the same. It's not the same. You're right. It's hmm. not the same. <laughs> They're getting a new guy now, right? Trevor Noah's gone. Who's the? He's gone. I don't know who the new guy is. I don't know who the new guy is. It's either. available as a, as a gig. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what are you looking at me for? I got a gig. Anyway, at least I think I do. Okay. Let's, um, let's move on to this. Sue Ann, a recent American survey suggests 40% of Gen Z, or Z, whichever, and millennials seek out news, while 60% bump into it. Mm. How well informed was the average boomer four or five decades ago? Four or five decades ago, I think boomers were better informed than young people. Now, there were fewer forms of entertainment, mm -hmm. and it was cool in most circles to know something about politics. That just from my teaching, which is the, where I was teaching younger people, obviously, news, and these were journalism students, was not nearly as big a factor in their lives. I think part of it may have been to do with the sense that they weren't going to be able to influence it so much. Mm. And if I were 20 now looking at the world, I, I would feel very powerless, which might cut down on my interest in news. You know, back in the 60s, we thought we were going to take over the world and change everything, which made the news more interesting. Well, when, you kind of did, didn't you? Yeah. Not, we didn't do such a good job of it, but yeah, we did. Yeah. Uh, just uh, for, by way of information, you used to teach at what was then called Ryerson University. Yes. You taught journalism. And I'm curious, do you think we, as a society, the big we, were better served when there were three American networks only, ABC, CBS, NBC, it was, you know, Huntley and Brinkley, and it was Peter Jennings, and it was, okay, just those. Were we better served Cronkite in that universe or better served today? I can't say that we were better served then. I would love to be able to say it, but it's not true. The news that we received, which we thought was a, you know, an enormous view, a full view, was in fact very narrow, and some of it mistaken because we were more trustful of governments in those hmm. days. Uh, you have a much wider range of information and views. Now, unfortunately, much of it is made up and is nonsense. Uh, if you watch Russian TV, RT, which <laughs> is harder to get now than it was, <laughs> it's fascinating what they get away with. But on the other hand, more groups are represented. There are more stories, but you really have to seek them out. We didn't hear much about parts of the world then because no one was interested. We're not hearing, if you're mainstream media, there are parts of the world you're not hearing about because there's no money in it for the newspaper or for mm. the TV. There's no payoff. No one cares about Indonesia, but they ought to. Hmm. As you seek information, do you tend to go to one or two or three trusted sources and that's about it or are you with several dozen how does it work for you i think a few trusted sources because it's habit over time that you develop and i also think an interesting point piggybacking off of what you had said about seeking news out i think that feeling of helplessness and powerlessness, we feel that. And that's reflected even in the voter turnouts that we see. People feel more disenfranchised, less engaged. And so I think part of that is the impact that news has had on us, but yeah. Hmm. Hey, so when I was growing up, the, uh, you know, we had a daily newspaper come to the house and you read the daily paper. That's how you got your news and you watch some TV news as well. How do you do it? Um, yeah, the bumping into news is definitely very accurate. And I, I would say that that is mainly how I got news growing up. Um, now I am a bit more, um, I, I try to actively seek out news, um, newsletters from journalists are very important. And then that's sort of filtered down through me to the people who follow me on TikTok. Now that's interesting. Uh, journalists who you seek out in their mm -hmm. newsletters, as opposed to say the Vancouver province or the New York times or that you're, you're less about the mainstream media. Um, I definitely read the mainstream media, um, but I think generally my generation has a, a fairly healthy skepticism of just getting your news from mainstream media. So I try to diversify, especially because, you know, people listen to me. Gotcha. Paolo, how about for you? 
Well, uh, I think uh, it's time to be active and proactive in the way we engage with the media. Mm -hmm. So this is a generational change. So we are all learning. When Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message, he also said, and the user is the content. Mm. So we are entitled mm. to this kind of proactive uh, approach in the way we seek out for media, in the way we tend to customize the way we shape our own media diet. So it's, we are entitled, we are on charge, we are part of it. So the user is the content means that uh, we play a role, right? Instead of a passive role, we play, play an active role in the way we shape this um, uh, information environment. And so that means that uh, our the new new generations will be uh, responsible to really shape a new media ecology where uh, I'm optimistic in this. So the idea that uh, this proactive approach of my students uh, will make them more, uh, uh, again, responsible and uh, uh, helping them to uh, lead the way we create our information environment. You know what was interesting just now? When you said the user is the content, I heard Hazel and Sue Ann and myself all go, hmm. Because <laughs> nobody remembers the second part of that yes, statement. We right. remember the medium is the message, but the second part of the statement yeah. we don't remember, and and his profundity half a century later is still there, isn't it? Marshall Absolutely. Uh, this is, then it's called uh, uh, participatory culture, participatory culture. So we participate, we engage with, so we play, we play this active role. And this is part of the, the new mindset, the new attitude of the new generation with, the, uh, with social media and digital platforms. So uh, if, for, uh, if the TV, the computer was a screen or a window, so no pun intended, the cell phone is a world. Mm. The cell phone is a platform, a place within which they live. The cell phone is, a, is something that shapes entirely the operating system of this generation, mm -hmm. the operating system of the sensory life of this generation. That's why, well, uh, my students are not accustomed to read on paper, for instance, yes. right? Uh, which is like installing an old piece of software into a new operating system. It doesn't work, simply doesn't work. So Marshall McLuhan would put it uh, like uh, uh, asking an eagle to swim. Right? So <laughs> two different worlds. Yes. So that's why understanding the world, the environment, we call it media ecology, understanding the hyper-connected system that regulates right, the contemporary life is the perfect way to adjust, cope, and discover exploring the potentialities for the new generations. Well, I want to understand one aspect of this media ecology a little better. And again, I'm going back to Hazel on this because in spite of the numbers we put up earlier, I'm constantly surprised how many young people stop me in the streets and, and know about this show and watch it. And, and I want to get, I want to understand them better. What, what is the secret sauce to being a popular TikTok host as you are content creator, whatever you call it, <laughs> and, and try to, I mean, I'll, we'll go back to the carbon tax. You, you did a riff there on a fairly complicated subject, which is how the carbon tax will affect Canadians and the taxes they pay and so on. What's the secret to, to doing that well? Hmm. Um, the way that I try to make my videos and why I think they're successful is because I try to explain things like I would to a friend. Um, so that is exactly how I would explain a carbon tax to, say, a friend saying, oh, I, I wish that there wasn't a carbon tax. I would explain it just like that, um, including the money gun joke. So <laughs> I think that uh, people sort of want authenticity um, from their creators. And at That's the risk of favorite. asking a stupid question, how do you know if it lands? Um <laughs> I mean, you have a very good idea if it lands because it either gets a bunch of views or it doesn't. Simple as that. Yeah. Right on. So, Ann, do you, I mean, again, we're a little bit old school, you and I. Do you, do. A little bit? Do. <laughs> I was probably trying to be gentle here. Do you accept the inevitability that the way that we used to consume news ain't never coming back and it's a whole new universe and we better just suck it up and enjoy it? Absolutely, but I'm much less optimistic than Paolo about this mm. because what this, what his analysis, brilliant though it is, is leaving out is artificial intelligence and the ways that it can be used, money and bad foreign actors. Imagine someone of Hazel's talents 
working for a government that was hostile to us spreading misinformation. Mm -hmm. There are people like Hazel who are doing precisely that, and there are going to be a lot more of them. So, yes, I'm, I, I have to accept it, but I'm very worried about it. How terrified are you about the new AI media universe we're about to jump into? Well, uh, this coming fall, I'm going to teach. Well, I will not be teaching the very first class entirely taught by AI. And so I like to experiment. I like to really uh, take uh, the next level. So to some extent, uh, in an age of AI, so rethinking the role of the educator, rethinking the role of the students. And so I think the key is AI literacy. So I'm not scared because uh, literacy, AI literacy in particular, can really make us explore, understand what uh, usually we fear what we don't know. Yeah. So our role as an education institution, a university, is to foster literacy about something that we don't know yet. Amen to more literacy. I want to thank the four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. Hazel Thayer, the Gen Z TikTok creator in Victoria, British Columbia. Nur Malik, the millennial working in a marketing and tech firm. Paolo Granata, St. Michael's College at the U of T, and Sue Ann Kelman, formerly at Ryerson University and a CBC producer and a boomer. And that's okay. Thank okay, you. Boomer? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Monday on the agenda. If we look at historical trend lines, uh, technology has net-net led to, to more. More industries, new avenues. Um, but how those jobs get created, who has access to them, uh, and who is given the resources, time, and skills to pivot towards them, that can absolutely be uh, a problem in terms of, of equity. And if we look in even the last 10 years, how income has kind of been divided, it isn't trending in a direction that's favorable uh, or equal. Also, on the agenda. So the fundamental you know, mathematical basis of, of AI machine learning has been around for a while, but we did not have the amount of data that we have now and the granularity of that data. And then we didn't have the computational ability to process that data. So theoretically, we could do this, but now we can actually practically do it. We have the horsepower behind it to actually make these discoveries happen. That's Monday on the agenda. <laughs>